Again, welcome back, everybody, everybody that was gone and sick and everything. Okay, so let's get cranking here. All right, uh, you, we can't start talking about, we, we actually got into this a little bit, and uh, I want to thank uh, Marissa uh, after, after class uh, for coming up. She was so excited because she said, oh, we were talking about the Canterbury Tales and Middle English and stuff, and, and uh, of course, she does a lot of that in her class, saying thank you, Marissa, for for that motivation, so I actually added a slide in here to, <laughs> to help us with, with that. But uh, you can't talk about the English language without talking about the Anglo-Saxons in England. And, uh, and so uh, we're going to, uh, again, go over this just real quick, uh, again, because we, we touched this slide just momentarily last week. Uh, now, the thing is that there were, there, were, there were a lot of things going on. England was a uh, Great Britain, the Isle there of Great Britain, where Scotland and Wales and England are, are all on that, sharing that, that island together. There was a lot of stuff going on. And um, there were a lot of things going on with the language that were uh, causing a lot of changes in the language. And so... Uh, uh, again, I mentioned last week, if you ever saw the, uh, the TV show, it's called The Last Kingdom uh, on Netflix. Uh, it, it deals with this era, this era from uh, 735 to 950 in the time of Alfred and the, the attempt for uh, people to bring England together. All that was going on um, before uh, the Norman invasion, which we're going to kind of get into it a little bit also. But uh, in King Alfred and others... Uh, we're trying uh, during this period of time to uh, bring the English, the, uh, the, these different peoples together, the, these Ang the Anglo-Saxons, uh, which are not from England. I didn't know that. They, they, these, are, these are tribes that came from northern Germany. <laughs> and, and so, uh, again, somebody of German background, uh, we were just everywhere all over the place. So, uh, But he was trying to... Uh, to uh, get some translations into English going to help bring the people together. And uh, there weren't any Bible translations as such at this time. It was, it was basically just stories and things, uh, portions of the Bible. Uh, things like Exodus, Psalms, Acts were all uh, translated into the language at the time, which was Old English uh, or some derivative of that was even farther back than, than that. And uh, there's, there's no manuscripts that have survived from this, but uh, it was mainly the, the idea of religion. When you, th when you thought of religion in the ancient European world, you thought of the Catholic Church, okay? And so just think, religion, Catholic. All of the known world for the Europeans at that time. And, and so Catholic policy drove all of that. And so all of these uh, attempts for uh, translating uh, into a local language were not looked at favorably by the Catholic Church. And you're going to see some reasons for that here as we, as we talk more about it. But <clears throat> when, the, when the Normans in, invaded in 1066, William the Conqueror came over from Normandy and, and, uh, and took over. Their idea was to come in and to bring the Norman culture to these backward barbarians up in the great, these Anglo-Saxons up there. Well, uh, the problem was that, that they didn't, they didn't uh, change the culture of the Anglo-Saxons. The Anglo-Saxon culture ended up changing the Norman culture <laughs> into Anglo-Saxon. So if, if you ever wondered why every once in a while you, you, uh, you see somebody British on TV and they have a weird French name. You know, and you go, uh, De Billiere, you know, and, and, and it's uh, Sir William De Billiere. And you go, this, this, that sounds French. Well, it's because it is French. It's, it's actually one of the Norman holdovers from there. But uh, the culture basically didn't change. What happened was we went into this period of time called the Middle English time. And the Normans uh, uh, caused this uh, changeover to occur in there, and, and from this, this 400 year period, from like 1000 to, to the late 1400s, is this, uh, this period of Middle English. And 
during this period of time, there were a tremendous number of changes in vocabulary and grammar and punctuation and all of that. And, and the problem for those of us that were looking for an English translation of the Bible during that period is there was no stable language for, for them to be able to translate it into. So until the language stabilized, there was going to be no English Bibles. As a matter of fact, the concept of England was, was a, a, just a whole different concept. And so uh, this, the, uh, when we talked about the printing press a couple of weeks ago, the printing press was one of the big things. One of the other things that it did was it, it acted to stabilize languages because now all of a sudden there was more stuff to read. It wasn't, didn't have to rely on the scribe down the block, you know, and, putting, and writing down the story so that on, on parchment so you could read it. Uh, this is now being printed off and things. So uh, this is the, the influence before the English kings got involved. And one of the, the, if you wanted an example, thank you, Marissa, for this. Uh, we, we talked about Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. I think most of us have heard about the Canterbury Tales. Okay, well, this right here, this is, this is what the writing looked like in Middle English. Okay, uh, now, you're not going to be able to read that. <laughs> uh, it's, it's like trying to read Cyrillic. Uh, in, in you know, the Russian uh, language, I mean, there's just, it, it's just a lot different. Not only are the words different, but, but if, you, if you tried to put it, uh, look at the, the three different time frames, the Old English, the Middle English, and the Modern English, and you, you put the words together, you start seeing some similarities there. So there's a growth that's happening. So thank you, Marissa, for that. And she has a really cool chart, too, which you didn't send me yet, so you guys got to remember to do that. All right. Which brings us to this guy, John Wycliffe. From, uh, he lived from 1330 to 1384. Uh, John Wycliffe had a lot of things that he, he was a Catholic priest. And he had this really strange idea. And that is that the common man was worth something. And you say, what's so strange about that? It was a strange, that's a strange idea for this time that they were living in. Because back then, the common man was worth nothing. Think about it. You know, original sin, you know, you're, you're just, uh, you know, worthless. You're always living in sin. You're depraved, da -da, you know. All of those kind of ideas were what they were living with during this period of time. Now, he, what he believed in, though, was the, the preacher should uh, be speaking to the congregation in a language that they could understand. And again, a, 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 an unheard of thing at the time because the, uh, the folks down uh, from Rome in the Catholic Church, uh, they had some policies that were different than that. And we'll talk about that in, in just a second. But uh, the, uh, the followers of, of John Wycliffe who had this, this idea of of people being worth something and, and the native language should be the native language, the language should be the native language of the people. They were called the Lollards. Uh, and that, I looked up that word law. The law is, uh, in, in Old English, is the, is the tongue and the movement of the tongue and the mouth. And the, uh, when they, they called them Lollards because it, to, to uh, Educated people, it just sounded like they were muttering and stuff like that. And this is where the, uh, the uh, Romans, uh, when they talked about people that were barbarians who didn't speak Latin, you know, they, they, their language sounds like a bunch of, you know, which is, is common for uh, if you don't understand what they're saying, right? So um, from 1382 to 1395, uh, a bunch of followers of John Wycliffe. This is a very short story here on Wycliffe. He has a really interesting story if you want to uh, do a, bio, a little biographical reading on it. But what happened was the followers of Wycliffe went and they uh, put together a series of things that, uh, that either he did directly or they were things that were inspired by him to do. 
and basically compiled all that together. And this became the, the, first, uh, the first full Bible translations into English. And they were from the Latin Vulgate. And you remember the Latin Vulgate was the official, uh, the Catholic uh, version. It was a translation of a translation, uh, but it was, it was the, basically the, the biggest thing that was out there and available at the time. And so uh, these, this compilation of different texts that were put together, they called it the Wycliffe Bible, even though it wasn't a full Bible. John Wycliffe never wrote a full Bible out there or translated a full Bible, but he, he got into the idea that he could uh, get back to the original languages, another one of those uh, people that were working with the original language. So um, in 1408, the Lollards were banned by the Pope. And then in 1428, Pope Martin V, after Wycliffe had passed away, he, they, they hated this guy so much, they went back and dug him up and then burned his body and then spread his ashes down in the, uh, the dirty creek that, that was near his home. I mean, this is how much they, they hated Wycliffe. Uh, so the Catholics uh, were, were not happy with this, the way this was progressing. Okay. All of that is a lead up to the English kings that began to have an influence. Without the English kings getting involved, there would have been no English translations of, of the Bible because the Catholic Church was not going to allow it. And so we're going to take a look at some English kings here. That I should say that throughout the 16th century, kings everywhere basically had a large influence over the faith of their people. Now, I'm not talking about them getting directly involved in it because the Catholics were still running the show everywhere. But they were the ones who were enforcing that law in their own countries. And so... It wasn't just in England that was, this was going on, but there's an interesting guy that we're going to talk, uh, talk about who uh, got very involved in this for completely unreligious reasons. <laughs> and anyway, these, these kings, the period we're going to talk about is 1509 to 1625, and these, these, uh, four of these five kings, the only one that didn't have a great impact was Edward VI, so we're not going to talk about him at all. But I've got up there Protestant, Protestant, Catholic, Protestant, Protestant. Uh, because there was the Protestant Reformation that was going on at the time, remember? And when uh, Martin Luther kink kicked things off in the 1400s, remember? Okay, it, getting, getting things started over there in Germany. All right, so they, now we're almost 100 years later, and now things are spreading out, and, and they're making their way over to England. So we're going to talk about Henry VIII. We're going to talk about uh, Mary the I, Elizabeth I, James I. All right, well, let's talk about this rotund guy first. <laughs> Henry VIII. Now, I don't know what you've heard about Henry VIII. A lot, yeah, I mean, he's one, they had a nice song that the, uh, they used to sing about, oh, I'm Henry VIII, I am Henry VIII. That is not the guy that we're talking about here. <laughs> different, different guy. But uh, Henry, Henry was an interesting individual, and... The, the, way, the reason he got involved in this discussion about translation of the Bible into English was because of this feud that he was having with Pope Clement the, the uh, Seventh over getting his marriage annulled, his first marriage. Okay? And ultimately, he was married six times. <laughs> once, once the floodgates you know, came open, he, he was, it was pretty much he was having fun with that. So for a period of seven years, from 1527 to 1534, he's in an argument with the Pope about getting an annulment for his, uh, for his marriage. And finally, he could not talk the Pope into giving him an annulment. So he said, fine, I'm going to create my own church. And he left, the, uh, pulled, <laughs> pulled England and all of his subjects out of the Catholic Church and, uh, and started the, the English Reformation, similar to the, the Reformation that we were talking about, except for, for very different reasons, very different reasons. You could say Henry was putting an annulment thing on his castle door. 
instead of the, uh, instead of the uh, doctrinal problems. So anyway, what this caused was the dissolving of the convents and the monasteries with, throughout England, got rid of all the nuns and the priests and everything, and established the Church of England, or the Anglican Church, which we know of today, and made himself, the king, the head of the church. Cool. Now I can get my annulment. Because <laughs> it's now, it's, it's, I'm now ready to do that. Uh, of course, he got excommunicated by the Pope. But one of the things that was happening at, at this time was uh, England at, was one of these growing countries that uh, had a lot of influence. And things that were going on in England had a lot of influence in, in other places. Other people were watching them. And um, so what, what happened is, is it was with, with them pulling, uh, excommunicating Henry, they, they, they did it very quietly. As a matter of fact, it took five years for them to finally publicly announce that he had been <laughs> excommunicated. But take a look at, at the English translations that came about as a result of Henry's influence and the, and the time frame when he, was, when he was serving as king. We're going to talk about each one of those as it comes along. So, which leads us to our first question. What two English politicians were instrumental in moving Henry VIII toward acceptance of the English translation of the Bible? And what happened to them? And I should say that what happened to them was pretty common. And it was actually the same thing happened to each of them. So if you get one right, you, you're going to get them both right. But, and the, the, the men that were involved with this were very high-level politicians within, within England. So it's a, who can give me a name of, of the, the first one? I know you've heard this one. What is it? Thomas Cromwell. Very good. Okay. Now, Thomas Cromwell, he was the chancellor of England, which meant that he was the highest minister in the entire government other than the king. So you had the king, and then you had the chancellor, was, was the top guy. Uh, strong supporter of Henry. The reason that he fell out of favor with him is he made a bad choice down the road on one of Henry's later wives. And uh, that wife didn't last long, and as a result of that wife not lasting long, Thomas Cromwell didn't last long after. So what do you think happened to him? Yeah, <laughs> beheaded by the king for treason, picking the, picking the wrong woman. <laughs> this is not good for the king. All right, so how about this guy? Thomas Cranmer was the second one. Now, he, this is the highest guy in the religious uh, world, Roman Catholic religious world in in uh, England, and of course with the Anglican Church later on. Uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, you've all heard of Canterbury before. That uh, Again, the, the top religious uh, leader in there. Uh, now, this guy was really on Henry's side. He, he was the one that put, he was the lawyer that put the, the case together for uh, Henry's annulment that he never got. <laughs> so he wasn't very successful with it, but... Uh, and basically, he was one of these guys that wanted to break away. He was, he was the, the guy that was pushing Henry that, hey, we can't get this annulment thing done, so just break away from the church and, and build your own church. No problems. And so um, you'd think that this guy would be somebody that would, would be in good graces with Henry. But what, what happened to him? Burned at the stake. Burned, <laughs> burned at the stake. <laughs> yes. And... Uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't for doing something with King Henry. Uh, we're going to learn about this lady, Mary I, King, uh, Queen Mary. And uh, she, she, as a Catholic queen, uh, was not happy with any of these folks that were uh, anti-Catholic. And so she's the one that ended up uh, burning them at the stake. Okay, so who is it that translated the first New Testament into English from the Greek? And then what happened to him? Okay, who is this guy right here? 
Who is it? William Tyn Tyndale? Tyndale, yeah. Okay, yep, this is William Tyndale. And uh, we've got the, we've got the, the print, printing press there in the back uh, because a lot of this exciting stuff was happening here at the, at the same time. William Tyndale was, was called the father of the English Bible because it's his translation from the original text that ended up being the basis for the King James Version down the road. And so this is where we get uh, once again introduced and reminded of uh, this guy named Desiderius Erasmus at Cambridge University who was an advocate for, uh, for the translations into all the, into the common languages. Okay, so you remember him from a, a few lessons ago, we, uh, we talked about this. So this, this idea that people in the congregation should understand what the Bible is saying, and uh, that was a radical idea because the Catholic Church didn't want it that way. They wanted everything in Latin, Latin Vulgate, and everything spoken in Latin. And uh, there were a lot of reasons for that for, for them. And so uh, he, William Tyndale, he opposed this idea this, of this Catholic law that prohibited the translation of the Bible, the Latin Vulgate, into the English in accordance with this Latin-only uh, doctrine of the Catholic Church. So uh, as you can imagine, uh, wherever Catholics were, wasn't a good place for Tyndale to be. Tyndale took off and uh, ended up in Germany, and over there he did this, uh, this work um, where he translated into English from the Koine Greek for the, for the first time. So we're talking about the New Testament. And uh, that, that turned out to be, again, a big deal. And out of that, as we were talking about before, came this thing called the Tyndale Bible. And and basically what it was, was it was Tyndale's New Testament that was from the Koine Greek into the English language. And uh, basically, it was, even though this was a great breakthrough and there were, being, and there were uh, Bibles being printed or New Testaments being printed with the, with the printing press, they were being smuggled into England, but uh, it, was against, it was against the law to be able to do it at the time. Because uh, Henry was still in the pre-annulment stage of things. So all he's interested in doing is playing around and being the king and, and uh, keeping the law. And the law was the Catholic uh, law at the time. So, so in here we... we uh, we have the, the, these first English uh, translations, uh, and, and he, he expanded that work, and he developed a following of people who followed, who followed his uh, leadership in, the, in these works. And so, the, um, and we're going to talk about those in a second. The, the thing you, you want to remember at this point, you're thinking, oh man, finally, you know, we're getting a... We're getting somebody that's going to the original language and they're, and they're uh, bringing it over to English. No, they're still using the Latin Vulgate as the, the, the main text for the translation. So they're going to the Vulgate, which is a translation of a translation. So this is a translation of a translation of a translation that we have. But it's in English, so <laughs> right or wrong... Good or bad, it's something that people can read, all right? So the idea is out there. Now, his Old Testament works that he ended up doing, uh, he, he went back and, and remember, he, he did the uh, translation from the, uh, for the New Testament, but he also went back before he died and he, and he did some Old Testament work. And all of that work that he did there the, these follow-on guys uh, with the Coverdale and Matthew Bibles used his works as the starting point for those Bibles. And so we're going to uh, get into that as we get down. Now, Tyndall, again, still working during a period when the Catholic Church was, was in charge, was a hunted man through all of this. And again, as they, we tried to smuggle Bibles 
again, New Testaments, other parts that he, of the Bible that he was uh, you know, working with, as they were smuggling in, they're burning them as fast as they can find them. And ultimately, he was executed in 1536. Ah, a little different, strangled, hung, and then, and then burned at the stake instead of being beheaded. But his final words, and, and they were prophetic words, were, uh, were that, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. That's all I ask. Those were the last things he said before he died. Okay, so after William Tyndale comes, Miles Coverdale. Miles Cover Coverdale was, uh, again, somebody that worked with Tyndale when he was in Germany. And he was, he, he was supportive of Martin Luther's work. Okay, so that's going to uh, give you an idea a little bit of the, of the little uh, bit of the taint and twist that is going to be in his, in his work. And he published, as a result of, of all of that, he published what was called the Coverdale Bible, after his name. Um, and it was a complete English translation of the Bible. And it was the first one that could be circulated, if you notice... The time frame, 1535. Remember, remember when the annulment was <laughs> that he was trying to work, work for? It? This, this, is, this is the time frame when the Anglican Church was established. Okay, So all of a sudden, it's not illegal anymore to have an English, an English translation of the Bible out there. And so without any official hindrance from the, from the Roman Catholics or because the, the king was getting rid of all the Roman Catholics, right, in, in there. That caused some problems later on. But he was also in, in there, and it was, it was officially okay for him to do that. Um, the New Testament of, the, of this Bible came from Tyndall's text. Do you remember that he did the original Greek over to English? Okay, that New Testament that he put together became the basis to start the New Testament part. Then the Old Testament came from the Latin and German translations. So that's why he worked with Martin Luther. And when they were translating into German, he would use the German text and translate the German text into English. And he would take the Latin Vulgate text and he would t translate the Latin into English. And so again, translations of a translation, still not fully back to the original text. And then we have this guy named John Rogers. Again, another person that worked with, with, uh, with Tyndale and in Germany. And he published the Matthews Bible. And the, re the reason it's called the Matthews Bible is because he worked under the surname or the pseudonym of Thomas Matthew. And so they call it the Matthews Bible because of the pseudonym that he, that he, he gave to it. But now he did his... English translation based on Tyndall's unpublished notes. So this is like, this is like going back to J.R.R. Tolkien's uh, original unpublished notes for the books that he didn't complete, and then taking those notes and writing a book based on it. And so, the, again, this was the basis for, for Rogers and what he was doing. But again, knowing where it came from, the Old Testament was still a translation of a translation because he's still getting it from, remember where they got it, the Latin Vulgate and the German over, over there that was translated. Okay, so that leads us then to the Great Bible. And going back to 1537 with the, the publication of the Matthews Bible, Thomas Cromwell, you remember the guy that got his head cut off, the Chancellor of England. Okay, Henry had him go to uh, Miles Coverdale, you remember Miles, okay, and to, to go in and, and revise the Matthews Bible, the one that had, just, that had just been done. And notice this, what the purpose was, was to create an English Bible that would be authorized by the king to be read in church. I remember that the new church was the Anglican church that had just started. They needed a Bible to read in church that everybody could understand. 
they had some Bibles that were out there, like the Matthews Bible, but now they want some, something that w would be possible for, that we now want to take a look at it and make sure that this is the version that we want to be in there. Now, notice the sources of this. The New Testament and some of the Old Testament were the Tyndale Bible. So they're still going back to Tyndall for his New Testament from the original Greek to the English. That was still good, all right? But then the remainder of the Old Testament, they're still using the Latin Vulgate and the German text because, remember, that's what the Matthews Bible used to, to put that into place. So it, we're still not there yet. We're, we're getting closer. We're getting closer. So notice God's providence in action through all this. Somebody as, as godless as Henry VIII, this is all happening during his reign. In a short period of time after he decides to get an annulment from his first wife, and the Pope won't give it to him. It, it, again, the, the, the God using godless people to help move his, his work forward. And uh, so in 1539, after the distribution of the Great Bible to every church in the realm, people started flocking to church to hear the word of God read. Now, preachers up to this time, if they were preaching in English, they weren't paying attention to this because they're, they're out, this is in Latin, <laughs> and, they're, and they're out speaking in that. Or they're, pre, they're preaching in Latin, which the people out there can't understand. So one is the... the Right language, wrong source. The other one is the right source, wrong language. Okay, so here now all of a sudden people find out that Bibles are in churches and they're in English. They can actually read it out of them and find out what God's word. Well, the preachers complained about this because you know, everybody preferred hearing God's word read out of the Bible to a preacher preaching up there and everything. So no, no knock on the preachers, but <laughs> they had the wrong source. So you remember William Tyndale's final words in 1536? Lord, open the king of, of England's eyes. This is where his, his prayer is finally, was finally answered because this is, being, this is something that the king is authorizing uh, to, be, to be done. So, question, what council took place at the end of King Henry VIII's reign, and what was its impact? Very famous uh, council, that, uh, and, and Kyle talks about it in the book a little bit. The Council of Trent in 1546. Okay, now, what was the Council of Trent? Who put that together? The Catholics did. Yeah, the Catholic Church has a little problem here. All right. For a while, Martin, it's been a while since Martin Luther started the Protestant Reformation in Germany. All right. And that's been spreading around. But even worse is this idea that you could go back to an original text and actually find out what that original text says. And then you can translate that into the common language of, of people. And now the common people can understand God's word directly. Ooh. That's, that's a little, that's a problem. The, so the, the, this, this was an attempt by the Catholic Church to kind of get on the bandwagon with the Protestant churches that were out there at the time because all of this, this Protestant rise is, is dealing with all these issues about going back to the original text, uh, translating into people that can understand, uh, all of these different things. And so the Catholic theologians here at this council decided we need to, uh, to get our act together here. Okay, so we're going to agree that the Latin Vulgate is the sole authoritative text for 
everything that has to do with faith and morals for all Catholics, okay? And as a result of that, remember with all these revisions, these are be, uh, revisions to the Bible have been coming out about one every year to year and a half now. Somebody's revising and, and going back and looking at new things and, and uh, translating out into this. And so as a result, they decided to go ahead and do, do uh, updates to the Latin Vulgate too be, to, to catch up on things. And so Pope Clement VIII, he published the final version of the Latin Vulgate in 1592. It was called the Clementine Vulgate. And notice the Council of Trent met in 1547. King Henry's reign ended and he died in 1547. And the Council of Trent was in 1546. So again, thinking about the, the impact that King Henry VIII had and the stuff that was going on. Again, you can't help but see the providence of God associated with this in all of these things that made it possible for all these changes to occur to, to help bring about uh, the, the English translation. Okay, then we, then we come up to this lady, <laughs> this fiery redhead. The next, the next two uh, queens of England are going to be red-haired, uh, woo, just... Uh, <laughs> Fireballs. Well, this one is Queen Mary the First. Uh, she only reigned for five years because of her uh, cousin, once removed, <laughs> twice removed, Elizabeth, who, who deposed her. But she had a lot of uh, different, uh, different names. Mary Stuart, Mary the First of Scotland, Mary the First of England. But her nicknames tell more about her individual reign than do her real names. Bloody Mary, Mary Queen of Scots. This is, this is, this is Mary the First. So, what impact did Queen Mary the First? Now, catch us now. What impact did she have on English freedom of worship and the translation of the Bible into English? And what do you think? Two Protestant kings, Henry the Eighth, Edward the Sixth, and then Catholic Queen takes over. What do you think would happen when she took over? <laughs> new, 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 yes. <laughs> what was that, Shirley? Persecution. Yeah, persecution. Absolutely. And um, how would that? How would that? Well, you can see how the persecution would impact uh, religious freedoms and things, getting together, worshiping. Uh, Persecution is persecution when it comes to that. But how about the translation of the Bible into English? I mean, we ju we're up to the great Bible, all right, where it, that, it's able and, and in the, all of these different churches, the Anglican churches. What happened to the Anglican church? Yeah, and it hasn't been around for all that long either. Uh, and so, I mean... They, you can see there's a lot of turmoil going on here. So, yeah, she was a strict Catholic queen. She basically undid all the progress. This is like new president comes in <laughs> and, uh, you know, executive order, executive order, executive order, get rid of everything that the guy before you did. And then the new president comes in, executive order, you get rid of the, all the stuff. I mean, it's basically what she, what she was doing. And, and so, she, uh, now, how many of you have heard of the, the, the Puritans? Okay, mm, yeah, Plymouth Rock, the Pil Pilgrims, uh, that, was, that was those guys. Uh, the Netherlands, these guys, uh, the Netherlands had a lot more religious freedom than England did at the time. And so the people were not only uh, leaving England for persecution going to the New World, but they're going to the Netherlands and stuff. And that's why there were in a bunch of wars going on at this time, too. It was not just about power, but it was about religious freedom and all that was happening. And so um, the public reading of the Bible in English was forbidden. Uh, Thomas Cranmer, remember the Archbishop of Canterbury and John Rogers, both of them uh, were burned uh, at the stake. Uh, and, and Miles Coverdale, who was the one that, that uh, produced all those good works at the end that led up to the Great Bible, uh, he was harassed and threatened, though not killed. So, 
which leads us up to this Bible called the Geneva Bible. And who was it that made widespread use of the Geneva Bible? We'll answer this question first, and then we'll talk about the Geneva Bible for a second. Who? John Calvin. Not specifically John Calvin, but the followers of John Calvin. And followers of John Calvin in the New World and in England at the time being persecuted, starts with a P, the Puritans, right, because they were going for the pure doctrine. That's what, that's what they were they're doing. So, yeah, the Puritans were the ones that used the Geneva Bible. Now, Geneva Bible, 1557, was published in Switzerland by this guy named William Whittingham, who was John Calvin's brother-in-law. Okay, so no influence there, right? <clears throat> and so what it was was the great Bible, the one that, was, that they had in all the, the churches of the realm, but with notes. Calvin, John Calvin's notes in the, in the corners, as you go, it was like the, the, fir, the first the open Bible or study Bible that you have in there with the little notes around the side to tell you what to think. Okay, so this, this was John Calvin's think so's in the margins. And it became known as the Pilgrim's Bible because this is the one that the, the, the Puritans brought with them on the Mayflower to the United States, not the United States at the time, still a couple hundred years away, but uh, to, to uh, the New World, all right, and this is what they lived by, the, the folks that were up in New England, okay? So, uh, yeah, had a, had a big influence there. Which brings us then to the other redhead, <laughs> Queen Elizabeth I, okay? And she let her uh, <clears throat> relative, Mary I, stay in office for about five years, deposed her, gone. And one of the things that was interesting uh, here during uh, her reign, and she had a long reign, was the, the Bishop's Bible and the publishing of the Bishop's Bible in 1568. Now again, she went out to uh, this guy named Matthew Parker, and her, what she wanted him to do was to revise the Great Bible. Well, what was the problem with the Great Bible at this time? It, the comments in the, in the margins, exactly, which were the Calvinist uh, comments. She, she eliminated all those comments and then placed the, that pure, <laughs> no-comment Bible in every church building. Okay, so again, now we have, she's back to the thing that Henry had been, had been doing. And then just as a side note, was also happening during her, or the time she was in office, was uh, the Douay Reims Bible. And uh, basically by the late 1500s, Rome had kind of given up in trying to hold back the express of Protestantism that was going on. And the, their own, their own uh, Bible, the Latin Vulgate, was, was uh, getting out of date and people were expecting it to be updated, but it wasn't being updated. And updating was the thing to do as far as when you find new texts and things like that. And so, 1582 published an English New Testament for Catholics from the Latin Vulgate. Remember, there were Catholics in England still, right? And there were Catholics in Scotland. Scotland was most, mostly Catholic, as was Ireland. Ireland. And, and so, their subjects, uh, for Rome, their subjects needed a Bible that they could read. And so... Uh, over, over it came, and so we have in 1609, they published the English Old Testament, and so now combining it with the 1582 version, this became the only English Bible authorized by the Catholic Church for Catholics worldwide, everywhere. So anybody that spoke English, boom, it's in there. And, but... <laughs> Keeping up with the Catholic tradition, they used the Latin Vulgate as its textual basis for it. So it's still a translation of a translation. So, all right. So we will, I know you're waiting for it. I know Ray's waiting for it right here because we're going to talk about this guy to start off next time. And all of you who, who have your King James versions or your new King James, we're going to talk about where that came from 
next week.